we obviously know like these days electron has become very popular um using web front end technologies has been very popular um but as go users you know how can we take advantage of those things um so yeah so i i built this i built this project uh so that we can do that so this talk hopefully is a, a technical introduction uh on the project uh just quickly about me i'm originally from a country called uh, in fact wales a uh, complete coincidence uh, I'm now based in Sydney, Australia, and I've been a professional programmer for about 25 years. I've been using Go for about five years, and before that, uh, I was using Node.js. Um, I've always enjoyed using JavaScript for visualizations and front-end UIs. I've always been really, really like a visual person, really enjoyed that. Um, but I was frustrated when I started using Go that I couldn't combine the power of Go um, with the flexibility and the richness of the front-end technologies that I was used to. And so I invented this project, which I'm hopefully going to go through this with you um, over, the, over the next half an hour. So what, what are we going to cover? We're going to cover, like, what is Wales? What is this project? Uh, the second thing is, you know, what's new in version two? And the, the reason I'm going to cover that is because um, just recently we've just had a, a version upgrade, uh, at least a beta release of a, of a new version, um, which brings significant changes to the project. And so it would be... Um, remiss of me not to talk about those those changes at this point in time in case you wanted to go out and, and try it and think, you know, what, what are all of these new changes? So we're going to go through that. And then finally, we'll go through a, a demo. Uh, I have pre-recorded the demo because um, I'm so excited about this project that I could go on for absolutely ever. So I've recorded it, cut it down to a reasonable length, um, and I'll, I'll play you that. So first of all, what is what is Wales? Wales is a project that helps you build desktop applications by combining Go and web technologies. Whoa, doesn't that sound a bit like Electron? Uh, yes, it is, a little bit like Electron, um, but it's a little bit different. It's a cross-platform, lightweight, and fast Electron alternative for Go, but it doesn't embed Chrome, which has a lot of benefits. You can easily build applications with the flexibility and power of Go but you can combine it with a rich modern front end. And so it's kind of merging these worlds together. Uh, on the slide here, I've put in React, Vue, Svelte, and Angular. Um, in version one of the project, you get those templates for free. You can actually quickly generate projects using these technologies. With version two, is a little bit different, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. And it comes with a CLI tool. So you can actually generate, build, scaffold out your projects and, and package it up into um, single binary applications native to your, to your platform. So that's pretty exciting. The other thing I want to say is that it also allows you to call your Go methods from JavaScript um, because it's great having Go and it's great having this beautiful front end, but how do you make them talk together? And so what Wales offers you is a very, very easy way to call your Go methods as if they'd been written in JavaScript. And finally, the packaging of the application at the end, when you've finished developing it and you want to distribute it, it actually does all that packaging for you. So you get this single native application binary, and it deals with things like, you know, how do I get the icon there? Uh, for Windows apps, like how do I get the manifest? You know, how does the, how does it process the manifest file, um, which contains information about the binary? For for macOS app files, like how how does it work with the info.plist? If you're if you're aware of of how you package Mac apps, so it handles all that for you, um, and it gives you it gives you those files so that you can customize them as well. So although Wales is kind of quite opinionated, it gives you all the flexibility because all of the files that it uses to do all of this stuff for you, it leaves on your file system and, and you can just edit them and it, uh, it will use them if it's been changed. So you get the flexibility. Okay, that's cool, but does anybody use it? Uh, so a little showcase here. Um, Wombat is a, a, a beautiful little um, tool that was written by uh, a guy I now work with, uh, Roger Chapman. It's a multi-platform gRPC client um, it's it's had amazing reception on on Reddit, and that's how I got to find out about it. Um, 
and it's amazing when you build these sort of tools and frameworks um, and it comes out the woodwork that somebody's used it. You, you just don't know who's using it. Um, and when you do look at it and you see it, you think that's, that's brilliant. You know, your, your time spent doing the, the project has been, has been worth it, you know, and, and people have been getting a lot of enjoyment and use out of it. Uh, secondly is this uh, project called Wally, and it's the official firmware flasher for Ergodox keyboards. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of Ergodox. They, they make these really cool looking keyboards, um, and they developed, their main developer um, ported their flash, uh, firmware flasher to, to use Wales. Um, and finally, this I've included this because it looked great. Um, it's something called Molly Wallet, uh, which is a, a, a cryptocurrency wallet for the Constellation Network. So uh, I don't know if Javier's um, heard of these guys, um, but it shows you what you can do with the power of Go because Wombat deals with um, network protocols, low-level network protocols. You know, Wally's dealing with low-level system protocols, uh, and Molly Wallet's dealing with um, yeah, whatever, whatever cryptocurrency is, I'm sure Javier will help us with that. So who is this project aimed at? So it's aimed at uh, Go programmers who, you know, are competent with Go. They, you know, they, they've maybe built libraries or applications, and that's usually CLIs. But they want to put, you know, rich web-like UIs in front of their applications. And so the aim of the project is to make that as easy as possible for you. OK, how does it work? So uh, a general application will consist of two distinct parts. You've got your application logic, as you'd expect, that's written in Go. And then your front end UI consists of you know, your HTML, your JavaScript, CSS. And they are pure HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. There's no special pre-processing or whatever going on with that. So this is, uh, if we try and visualize that, the main application, which is the, the outer, outer uh, square, has the main program in it, it consists of the main program. When it starts, it creates a web view. And so within the window, there will be a, a web view. And that will be that will be the whole window will be the web view. And inside that web view will run your HTML and your JavaScript and your CSS. Now, obviously, your Go methods and, and your application logic um, will live in the in your main program. Uh, so, how do you how do you call those? You know, how do you how do you combine these two worlds together? How do you make them sing? Well, you have these things called bindings. Now, if you have a, a Go methods in the in the back end, you can tell the tell Wales, you can tell the startup program these are the things that I want to bind to the front end. And then at runtime, you'll be able to access those in JavaScript. So there's wrappers, let's get too technical, but there's wrappers that get automatically generated. And those wrappers will call into your Go methods and return values, which means that your JavaScript code now can call your Go methods and deal with, and deal with that. There's also a runtime library as well. Um, I've put it in the main program part because there's, there is a Go. The Go part is the, is the main part. The, the runtime library is written in Go. Uh, and with that, you can actually control things in the web view. You can control you know, the window. You can control, you can commit events. Um, you can do a number of things. Um, something I've uh, omitted on this diagram is actually the, the runtime library. There is a subset of the runtime library that does live in JavaScript. So you can call a lot of those functions in JavaScript as well. Um, and the interesting thing about that is because you've got this um, this dual runtime library, um, you're able to do some amazing things, especially around eventing. So what it gives you is this unified eventing. So you can create events in JavaScript, emit them, and you can receive them in Go, and you can send data along with that. So you could send you know strings, arrays, whatever along, and they will appear in Go. Uh, in the events, and the same the other way as well. So, so if you emit an event in Go with some Go um, data, then that will get emitted and uh, consumed on the JavaScript side. And those type conversions happen for you automatically. So how, you know, what, what use would that be? Well, um, I, I actually use that for a number of programs. Uh, one of the big ones is a file watcher. So if you've got a Go program that's just watching files, anytime that there's a change that happens, you can just emit an event 
and 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 not worry about it. So you could admit an event, you know, call it file changed and give the, the file name. Uh, and the JavaScript can react to that and go, oh, okay, cool. Um, and the cool thing about that is that you know you just have to insert that into a state store uh, in your in your JavaScript side, uh, and your whole UI will just start updating automatically. It's pretty amazing to see that happen, actually. And the opposite is true as well. So on the JavaScript side, you can emit events. Um, and so like the example here is like you, you, you've got a slider. So maybe you want to use a slider to throttle a load tester. So you've got a load tester running in, in Go, um, and you just want to throttle that in real time. Or you know, there's plenty of, plenty of other examples I'm sure you can find. So yeah, show me the code. Um, but first, uh, at this point in the presentation, I would normally go, right, well, here's, here's a demo. Uh, but just this week, newsflash, um, version 2 is now in beta for both Windows and Mac. Um, Linux is in progress. Uh, version 1 does support all three, uh, but there's limitations for version 1. Version 2 is, um, I would say, almost a revolution instead of an evolution of the project. Uh, and so I really wanted to focus on, on that for this presentation. So please bear with me with that. If anybody's used version one, um, some of these updates are going to be extremely welcome. Um, if you haven't used version one, then just assume that it's always been like this. <laughs> so what's new in version two? So one of the big pain points for, for Windows users in version one was that it used um, the IE11 renderer. Um, yeah, so that, that comes with a whole host of, uh, whole host of problems, right? Um, for one, it didn't have a debug console. So people were always saying, well, I'm getting a script there as an, I don't know how to debug them. And I would have to say, well, neither do I. <laughs> like IE just doesn't support that. So we're now using Microsoft's new WebView2 component. And that has the full dev tools environment. And it's based on WebKit. So that's a huge plus. There's also native UI elements. Uh, one of the big things uh, that got requested after version one was, you know, how can we make menus? That is now supported in version two, and you have um, options for you know checkboxes, standard menus, um, even radio boxes. Uh, yeah, so it's it's pretty it's pretty um, comprehensive, and then the dialogues as well. Uh, from version one, the file file dialogues weren't that great. Um, I can't really remember why, uh, but they they were based on some older versions of of file dialogues. Version two uses the complete up to date modern file dialogues, and they're very, very configurable as well. So you can do like, you know, multiple select, um, create folders, um, don't show hidden files, all that sort of stuff. And Windows version two is pure Go. Um, no C Go dependencies. The big problem with using C Go on Windows is you need a MingW compiler. Uh, where do you get that from? There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, very tricky to set up, very tricky to get right. It's now pure Go. So uh, everybody was super happy about that, especially this guy. Uh, I don't know who he is, but he told me he was happy. Um, finally, no DLLs to redistribute. Uh, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because the Microsoft Web V2 WebKit component, uh, the only way you can really use it is if you ship it with uh, some bootstrapping code. And the bootstrapping code is called Web V2 Loader. Now, Microsoft recommends that you either statically link that code because they provide a, a static library uh, within your application, or you uh, ship the WebView 2 loaded DLL along with your app. Now, as Go developers, that's a bit of a problem, right? Because we're used to the single binary. It's, it's you know, the holy grail of the single binary. Now, all of a sudden, you've got to ship that with a DLL. So for Windows, do you create an installer? You know, where does that DLL sit? Um, and every... Every other project that I know of in Go that, or in other languages as well um, that can't link to um, WebView, uh, sorry, Microsoft libraries has this problem. Um, and Go can't link to those Microsoft libraries either. So you know, what, what option do we have? Uh, actually, we do have an option. Um, we've, we've managed to, with working with a, uh, another guy, a guy called John um, Chadwick, he has built a DLL, Windows DLL loader in pure Go that you just give it the bytes and it loads it as if it's loaded it from disk. So we actually embed the DLL in the application and it just loads it at, at runtime. 
doesn't extract it, doesn't do any of that. It literally loads it into memory uh, and, and Windows processes it as if it's been loaded from disk. So the single binary dream lives on. And as far as I'm aware, no other application does that without statically linking to Microsoft's libraries. The front end as well is a huge change. Um, Wales version one used a library, very popular library, very good library called WebView. Um, and the way that WebView gets you to insert um, JavaScript into the, into the WebView is either through pulling it from an external source uh, or you exec like a whole bunch of uh, a big string, basically a whole bunch of bundled JavaScript. And, and Wales version one did that too. Um, the problem is with that is that when you have uh, complex JavaScript uh, front ends and you use lots of libraries, it's that you need to bundle. And so the burden of getting that down to a, a single by a single string is on the developer. And it gets really tricky when you think about things like images, fonts, like, you know, I've been there, you know, you're on Stack Overflow. It's like, how do I include a, an image in my, in my bundle? How do I get a font in my bundle? And it's so hard. Uh, so Wales V2 scraps that whole idea. What it does is it actually uses an embed FS um, variable. So it uses Go's native embed to embed an entire directory into the application. And the front end literally just acts like a web browser. There's nothing special about it. it when it starts up, it will issue a request for basically index HTML. And that gets intercepted by um, a virtual web server that I've written. And when it sees that request, it it gets it it looks then into your embedfs for your index HTML. It injects all of the JavaScript runtime and the special runtime that we've got, and it returns it back to the front end as if it's as if that's how it was always built. Every request from that point on um, will be from the HTML. So it would be like, I want to load this image. Well, that's fine because when it requests it, the virtual web server will go to the embed FS and it will load, it will look for the image at the same directory. We use the index HTML directory as the root. So it doesn't really matter like how you how you use the embed FS. It could be, you know, three directories down, it could be dist forward slash and then your assets. You just don't need to worry about it. Like you just you just um, uh, embed embed the dist directory and that's it. You don't have to worry about it. And what this means is that now we have a new dev mode. And what that does is it, instead of going to an embed FS, it just goes to disk. And this means that you can do a lot of cool stuff with development, like live reloading. Uh, and so it acts like a browser, but it's, it's the actual desktop app that's getting reloaded. A couple of other things, um, eye candy. We, um, on Mac, we love this sort of frosty, frosty look. It's pushed a lot on, by Swift apps. Um, you don't see it so much on Windows, but I think with Windows 11, now it's coming out more. This is literally just config away if you want to make your app look cool. Uh, and now a demo. So what I'm going to do with the demo is, I'm, I've, like I said, I pre-recorded it. I hope we have time for it. Um, this is just installing Wales. How do you initialize a project? What, what is the project layout? What does the dev mode do? Let's look at live reload. How can you develop with a web browser? That's an interesting idea. Um, and how do you build your final presentation? To the installation page. We are going to do uh, macOS, actually macOS 11 uh, on ARM. There is support for Windows 10 as well. Win both Windows and Mac are currently on beta releases. Um, Linux will be available probably in about eight to 10 weeks. Wales has a few dependencies. Um, just go on 17 plus, so that's easy enough. And then npm. Um, on the website, I've said node 14 plus. Your mileage may vary depending on which version of node you install, but node 14 plus is what we test. The other thing to install on Mac is the Xcode command line tools. There is a command there that you can copy and paste it and that will install it for you if you haven't got it installed already. Finally, we come to installing Wales. Now Wales is um, both a CLI and a, a support library. So you create projects using the CLI 
uh, and you build and you, you manage your projects using, using the CLI. So what we'll do is we'll show you installing the CLI, which is copy and paste in that. And there we go. By typing in Wales, you'll see that you have the CLI installed. And this allows you to do a number of things. We'll go through them. So you can build an application. You can initialize an application. Um, there's a doctor command, which will diagnose your environment just to make sure that you've got the correct things installed. There is a development mode, which we'll go into a bit later. Uh, there's a generate command for generating different uh, bits of source code. Um, we won't go into that this this demo. There is uh, an update command, which will allow you to um, update the CLI from, from itself and a, a version command. For our demo project, we will initialize a um, vanilla template. And we're also going to put in um, an IDE flag as well. Uh, I use Goland. So if you use the IDE Goland flag, then you will get um, some config files generated, which means uh, you'll get your run and debug configurations automatically created. If we look on the system, we have a test directory and inside test, you can see some files. What we'll do is we'll start up Goland in this directory and hopefully we'll show you through the project. So just a quick walk through through the project. Um, whilst this is, uh, yep, this is booted. Okay, so we have a main.go and the main.go is comprised of basically uh, a main function. We create an instance of an app. We'll come back to this. Um, and the only command really that you use in Wales is run and you pass in all of this config. So here we have title, width, height, minimum width and height, maximum width and height. Um, some other things like, uh, you know, is it resizable? Can you full screen it? There's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I won't go into everything, but um, it's all on the website. The default template has um, some Windows specific options and some Mac specific options too. Uh, again, they'll be covered in the, in the website. One of the big things is, you know, how do I get my assets embedded? Well, in here we've put in a front end source directory. We're actually embedding it into an embed FS type. And this assets variable is passed in. So this is really all of your front end assets for your application. And if we look into front end here, so front end is the, the default place for, for front end projects. For the vanilla template, we just have a source directory um, and we have you know assets, fonts, images. There's no bundling or anything. This is just flat files as if this was a web server being um, just serving those files. There's nothing special in here. They're just standard HTML, um, standard CSS, and standard JavaScript. The default application also has a build directory. In fact, all application, oh, sorry, all templates have the default build directory. And in here we have an application icon, which will be our application icon. And, <clears throat> excuse me, there are Windows specific files here and the Mac specific files in the Darwin directory. So I mentioned earlier about this, this app. Well, this app is essentially a struct which um, deals with all of our business logic. You create one, it's got a couple of uh, lifecycle hooks. So startup is uh, what is called by Wales uh, with a context. And that context is used for calling the runtime library, as we discussed earlier. The other lifecycle hooks are DOM ready, which um, will get fired when the content front end content is loaded. And then shutdown is called on the way down just to um, so you can tear down any resources that you've you've allocated. We've also got a function here called greet. Um, and this function is uh, exported. Um, you can see it's capital G. It accepts a name and it returns a string. Um, and the string is, you know, hello name, it's showtime. Uh, there's nothing 
magical about this at all. It's just a standard Go function. So how do we expose that to our front end? Well, we expose it to our front end through this bind configuration. So bind accepts a an array of uh, interface and that interface that has to be interface because the the struct may be different types. So whatever um, instance of a struct that you pass in here, Wales will attempt to bind that to the front end. And you can call those methods from JavaScript. What we'll do now is we'll run this in uh, dev mode. So Wales dev um, basically compiles the front end assets in the front end directory and it will bundle our application together and generate a real desktop application using those assets. The great thing is, is that uh, on the vanilla template, there is no bundling to be done. And what dev mode actually does is, um, is it actually reads the files off disk. So um, we'll show you that happening in a second. This is built and compiled. Okay, so this is the application, the desktop application. And if we type in uh, go Singapore here, hit greet, we get hello go Singapore, it's showtime. So this is actually, like I said, this is actually loading off disk right now. So we can, we can edit this. Um, if we go into the front end and look at the CSS, um, let's see if I can make this a little easier to see. There we go. So you'll notice there's a, you know, there's a, what do you call it? Uh, transparency. Yeah. If I change that to, let's say 0.5, hit save, you'll see that that instantly updated. If I change it to one and hit save, you'll see that it's instantly updated. And this isn't a web browser. This is a real desktop application that's live reloading from disk. So that makes quite a good development uh, tool. Although this doesn't have a web browser embedded, it does have a web view. Um, and that gives you all of the developer tools that the standard Apple web view component does. So if we inspect element, you'll get a full development environment like you are used to in a browser. Um, you can go through the elements, you can click on them, you can see what they do. And, you can, and if, if you look at this, there's, there's nothing, there's no special language to learn. There's no special JavaScript um, framework to learn. Um, it is literally just plain JavaScript, plain HTML. Um, and remember earlier, we looked at the greet function. So what Wales does is um, it binds all of the backend um, methods that you have exposed and you've bound, bound to um, the Go object in window. So it namespaces it by, pa by package name and then struct name, and then obviously the method name. So we have uh, main.app.greet. And this is actually a wrapper. Um, that calls the backend function um, over um, over an IPC channel. So you're able to actually call this um, with anything you like. So let's say Tom. Um, and what you'll see is it returns a promise. Now, obviously the front end is asynchronous. And so what we need to do is when we call the backend is just return a promise. And if that function completes correctly and returns a value, then that's going to be resolved. And that's going to be the result. If it throws an error, if the second parameter, the second return parameter is an error, um, and that is set on the way out, then it, the promise rejects. Um, so you're able to handle backend functions just like normal JavaScript functions. Yeah, if developing inside the Apple WebKit uh, browser is not your thing, then um, the dev mode actually opens up a web server as well. So if you click on this link, you'll see that the default application loads. It's this gray color because the um, because there's transparency here. In fact, we could edit that, right? 
So if we say that's fully transparent, you'll see that both the application and the browser have now been updated instantly. If you open up your dev tools, so this is Safari, so it's going to be pretty similar to, to what it is, but this could be Chrome or whatever browser you want. So we've covered how to bind methods from Go to the front end. We know how to call them in the front end. We've looked at the live load for the assets, um, changing the CSS. And in fact, uh, we'll just quickly change that back now um, because I want it to look funky. There we go. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at how, you know, this is great. We've developed it. Uh, how, how do we build it? How do we distribute it? So what we'll do is we'll just quit our dev mode and we'll look at the Wales build command. So the Wales build command by default will build, package, um, and create a native bundle for, for the platform that you're building it on. So there are a few extra things you can do with this. You look at the website, you can um, compress it using UPX. Um, you can you know, do things like clean the build directory. You can choose different platforms as well. So if we see this, this is said, if we've built it in the build bin directory, um, if we actually if we cd into build bin um, and then open finder, you'll see we've got our test build that we were developing with, um, and then this is your actual application. You'll see that it's got a it's got an icon. Um, this icon is configurable, uh, completely configurable. Whatever is in your build directory, this application icon you can choose. You can swap it out. It's it's fine. It's going to build that. Um, for Mac as well, it uses, I don't know if anybody knows about the info pre list, but it generates um, an info pre list for you um, so that it becomes a valid application. Again, if you change that, um, if you, you know, you want to edit this in, in whatever way, then that's fine. That gets bundled in as, as well. So if we go back to Finder, um, you'll see, we'll just flip down to list. Um, you'll see that it's 5.6 megabytes, which for a Electron-like web desktop application is really, really quite small. Um, but before I finish as well, I'd like to also look at um, cross-compiling. So when we build, we, we have a tester app uh, bundle. Um, for those who know, that's uh, really just a, a directory. And inside here, it's got some Mac related stuff. And one of the things is, a, is, is the actual binary that gets run. Um, if we run this through file, you'll see that it's uh, ARM64. I'm running on a M1. And, the, uh, and so by default, it's going to generate ARM64 files. Um, what we can do as well is if we go back to our <laughs> if we go back to our project directory and we type Wales build, we also have a platform flag. So if we say Darwin AMD 64, um, you'll see the architecture for the build has been flagged as AMD 64. So once that's finished building now, we can also run that through file. Um, it is in contents, I guess, yeah. Um, and you'll see that that's a x86-64, which on a Mac, uh, on an M1, sorry, that's going to run just fine. So test the app. It runs through Rosetta, so that's fine. So that's, yeah, 5.6 megs. So very, very similar. The other thing you can do is, uh, just make sure I'm in the right place, yeah. Um, the other thing you can do is you can actually build to um to something that's to a platform that's not native to go um but it's is native to wales which is universal so if you cross compile to um universal you'll see i mean that was very quick but if we look at the build bin directory now and we open that in finder you'll see that this is an 11 meg application now um and that's because it's, yeah, it's the um, 
what do they call them? The uh, the combined build universal app. <laughs> it's the universal app, um, which we can prove by also um, running file on the. Ah, uh, I'll get there eventually. So if you're in file on the actual binary, uh, you can see that there's two architectures in there. So uh, yeah, so it's super easy. So I hope this uh, very brief and uh, chaotic demo has given you some inspiration and some uh, ideas around what, what Wales is, um, what you can achieve with it. Uh, and I really look forward to seeing what everybody can make with this. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll just share my last. I've, I've literally got one one slide left. Thank you for your patience. Um, so yeah, so basically we went over it all, went through the installation, project initialization. Um, th th there's a whole lot there. Um, it's still very brief in terms of what Wales can do. Um, so I really look forward to your questions. Um, I know it's a little bit chaotic. Uh, I really appreciate your time. I just want to say thank you very much uh, for Golang Sydney. Um, sorry, <laughs> for Golang Singapore to invite me into this. This has been absolutely brilliant. Um, and yeah, I'm going to stick around, even though it's quite late. I'm going to stick around and uh, answer your questions. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. That was uh, very interesting. All right. Uh, we do have a few questions, though. Uh, first question from Adia. Could WebView be running without relying on client browser system? Like, for example, if the user doesn't have any browser installed here. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It doesn't use a browser. Um, the only thing, the only thing you need um, is so on on Mac and on Linux, they have the, so Linux. You'd have to install the GTK. I think it's got a, G, a GTK WebView. Um, it's normally bundled as part of the part of the system. Mac already has that installed as well through Cocoa. Um, the only thing you need to install on Win is on Windows is the WebView to runtime. Um, but we actually provide a way that in as part of your application when it starts up, your Wales app starts up. If it detects that it doesn't have it, then you can get your app to do a couple of things. You can get it to download the bootstrapper. You know, you can redirect the user to the page. Um, so it's very similar to like back in the day when you had the, uh, you know, you need to install the Visual C++ runtime uh, on Windows. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. But it okay. doesn't rely on a browser at all. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, we have a second sort of related question is from Sweden. Uh, so it, it comes in a few parts, but it's the same question. So Wales abstracts to display the web view. And uh, could web view be abstracted to show text? I think his use case is, uh, say, uh, a desktop application on Linux server. Yeah. Um, so is the question, can the web view show text? Yeah. Absolutely. It, it'll, show, it'll show whatever a web page will show. Mm, OK. Hope that answers the question, uh, Sweden. If not, you can uh, retype again. Is, is that clear? Yeah, comment from Sweden as well. I think this is probably uh, uh, for you to comment. Uh, like Wales is sort of a uh, like flutter, like instead of dot is go, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So, would you agree with that assessment? I don't know enough about flutter. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> all, right, all right. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see if there's any more questions. Ah, so okay, Sweeney so asking that like, if as a Linux with no GTK, is it possible? With no GTK, I think it's not possible with no GTK um, because it will use GTK WebView. I don't think we'd be able to support like Qt WebView. Like Linux is super hard to support anyway. Um, but just because you use a non GTK based um, desktop doesn't mean that you can't just install the package and, and use it. Um, I certainly haven't heard of anybody say that they're not able to run um, Wales apps on Linux distributions that aren't, you know, GTK. So you can run them on like KDE desktops and stuff. Okay. Because okay. normally, normally the normally they are that's installed by default. I okay. believe. All right, it's worth a try, Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> what one? Yeah. All right. 
how does navigating your different page work, right? Rendering a different template. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a great question. Just like a death, just like a browser. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so navigating, like at a technical level, um, if you navigate, um, it's going to try and load that file from your embed FS. If the idea is that you are doing sort of single page application and you want to navigate between between views, um, you can get a lot of access. You, you can do it basically. Um, you'd you'd need to use um, like a hash router, um, which a lot of the frameworks support. Mm -hmm. Because mm, okay. actually, if you're interested in that, then there's a um, there's a template available um, in Vue that that has that configured by default. 